Hey, thank you guys for coming. Um, we are welcomed by the Trade Desk, awesome host of over well over a year now. Um, bathrooms all the way out, all the way around, and then come back in. Uh, unfortunately, there is no shortcut for us. Um, got a couple of our organizers here tonight, which is fantastic. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, David's downstairs, and it's the first time I've had organizers here besides myself in a couple of months. Um, you know, this is the new website. Yay. Uh, just got this pushed out last week. Uh, I already tried to put in um, several events of, uh, from the past, but going forward, uh, this is what it all looks like. It's no longer going to have registration on here. Oh, it does. This is at the end of the day. I thought it went straight the whole time. Um, news, new uh, emails, the, the newsletter. Um, if you haven't subscribed to that, please do. Um, I'm looking for another call to action to, to bring it up again because I want to get more people on it. Uh, but that's where most of my posts are going to go for event notifications. Um, Twitter has not been the best here as of late for notifications. Uh, even, I'm not going to pay for Twitter blue or whatever they're calling it these days. Um, so um, join our Discord if you're not on there either. And this week, we've got Lee. Front-end performance. Back over. I'm going to stop sharing. Sure. And could share again. Okay, let's see. Oh, wait, we need. Will it do the video in the screen share, like if I share my screen at the same time? Yep. Great. I'll, I'll come in for the camera for a little bit. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody over here. <laughs> my name is Lee Blazik. Thanks for having me tonight. Small group, but that's okay. It's we get to know everybody better and everything. I, I think it's sometimes better. Um, and first, I'll just give you the four senses about me. Obviously, my name is Lee Blazik. And um, mostly, probably like most everyone here, we've talked a little bit, you know, we're all either full time or contracting full time. Like at the moment, I'm actually working uh, full time consulting for a company called Primerica. They do life insurance. Actually, I'm doing their technical parts with a hybrid app. So I don't actually know much about their insurance product, but they do something with insurance. <laughs> I'm consulting with them, working on their pipelines, performance in the build of the hybrid apps and getting them released and the automation. They're releasing a new app. So working on that. Um, it's in view, but I have spent decades working in React as well as Angular. And I've started doing programming in, in the web in, since 2003, since like Internet Explorer 4 and 5, before Angular, before Vue, before, before all the big ones that are most of all of our careers right now. Um, so we just still, it's all, it's all JavaScript, HTML, and CSS to me under the hood um, with, with varying opinionated things in between. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, and if you see this logo here, I have, a, I have an LLC called Berserk. When I started my career, the first five, five to six, I was really a small agency. And in fact, if I sound funny, it's because I'm a dual citizen of here in New Zealand. I actually started this. I'm born in America. I went to school here, immigrated to New Zealand, and I started this whole career there. <laughs> So if, like if you're around here, if you've heard of the Colorado School of Mines in Golden, like legendary, you have a degree from there in, in Colorado, you, like here's a job, what job do you want? In New Zealand, they're like, what, mimes? Mimes, are you a mime? So I had to reinvent my career and, and I did geology. Even though New Zealand has amazing geology, you don't get paid to do much with it. You just get to look at it and do tours. <laughs> so that's how I had this career switch. So I was basically an agency there, started it. Um, and then around 26, in, in 2010 or 11, you know, I. It was, it's, I, moved, I did the final switch from moving on to being my own agency, getting my own clients. I even had like the New Zealand Olympic Winter Olympic sports team as a client, I had their website. Um, but then I still, I was still half my time was doing networking and marketing, which is all great. But, you know, I realized, you know, I'd hit these limits and I'd have to hire out people and I always struggled getting people or outsourcing when I had too much for myself. And I said, all right, I'm just going to go work for a big company and I'm just going to be a developer so I can learn like, huge systems with apps and commits coming in every hour and different Androids and databases and all that. Um, and then, in, and that was around the same time Node was out in like Alpha and Angular was out in Alpha. And I was like, man, 
this is the way forward rather than trying to learn PHP and C sharp to do the different backends for different people. This is my career change. And in 2016, I moved back to the States. Basically, I'm, I'm sure you're all in Denver. I was here in Denver and doing the, just working in Denver, doing the consulting or, or full-time jobs, which usually only last two or three years anyways. <laughs> That's a career. But yeah, this, this logo and brand is like my consulting logo. I still have it in my LLC. We pick up small jobs, sometimes get bigger ones on the side or, you know, but right now I'm just full-time at Primerica. So that's me. And this, one of one of the longest stints I've done, um, and the, the way this talk is actually pre-COVID, I start, I've done three versions. This is the third version of this talk. Like I've done these talks where I save them on slides and I update them every few years because we're all front and everything changes every six weeks or sometimes every week. Um, but I originally did this when I was helping architect at the Vita Kidney Care, if you know the towers just over here. I spent almost a year and a half over there. And there I was, we had a huge floor of 100 devs. 10 different teams that was an Angular application. Um, and then there was another floor that had a React app that was like a video conferencing app. Um, but this, this mainly came out, we were having issues with performance there. And um, you, you'll hear me go about context, but the way this came out, this was started as lunch and learns for there because you can all think of our, our normal consumer application, maybe trade desk, or I'm not sure, but or you take Lyft, for example, they're just a company and they spit out apps, consumers use them on there. That's, that's like probably the majority case, but strangely, Maybe it's just me or my career. I've done a lot of internal tools. So the where this came out was at Vita Kidney Care, they do dialysis, right? People are dying, kidney failure, and these patients come in to these centers. Maybe there's five chairs, maybe there's 30 chairs, and these doctors, multiple doctors walk around and they need to see in real time the chemicals or the stuff I don't understand about these patients but like in real time and make decisions and say, hey, adjust it or do this. And performance was a huge issue there. And, for ages, it, it, was, it was a newer product as well, but they still couldn't figure out why. And so this came about, you know, I started, I started trying to investigate because if you're the front end people, like I didn't do the back end there at all. It was done by some team in Kentucky or Indiana, or I don't know where, and they never talked to you or you hear back three days later, but we get all the complaints about performance and here's doctors going like this, people are dying here and they, they would have traditionally gone to other architects or people and they're like, well, we want this mega data. Doctors like, I don't care if it's MongoDB or, or, or SQL, or I don't know what it is, it doesn't matter, but it needs to work faster so I can make it, I don't care what's under the hood, it's, it's not working fast enough in real time. And we got the complaints and finally I started looking into it and some of it was really quite simple, mainly network requests. Um, you can hear me go on a lot about that. But so this talk was, it was a broad talk for every aspect of the company from people out of state and the database and everything to understand how every part of the teams across this huge company was affecting the performance and what we could do at every level to improve it. Um, and so with everything, I, I got a bunch of lists um, and I'm not sure, maybe some people know have this, like I can adjust if people are like, oh, we know all about that, maybe that's cool. I'm not going deep into any one topic, but I touched on probably 10 to 30 different things. There is no, we don't we'll almost see no code in here. <laughs> and one or two slides show the difference though. Um, on things that we caught. But so that's that's how this started. And if we're ready, um, how, how and I had to do two two talks of this and this this first half is I call it before first paint. And I think now there's a newer term, it's before first before first meaningful paint. But I, I have I have links to some references that I use like is everyone here is probably familiar with Mozilla Developer Network. Like that's my go-to for when what, what term are we actually, what I, what I find so many places when I come to help or work at is everyone's using different terms. And, and even when it comes to like scrum masters and stuff, they're not supposed to exactly know what a term is, but it's like, what are we saying when we mean this thing? What are we measuring? Let, let's have a common dictionary and let's not write our own dictionary because that's a whole bunch of time. And some people want to do that, but that's time we could be using fixing things. So let's, there's a, a common dictionary like Mozilla developer network for your terms. What do these mean? Um, standards. <laughs> so the what the remembering an XKCD was like there are too many standards for this. Let's write a new one that just, let's write a, let's write a new one that encompasses all of these. There are now sixteen standards. Yeah, yeah. So I tried to use one because it's free and it's there and you can Google it. I, I find it's it's one of some of the better docs to look at. Um, so I'm assuming we're all at least know what that is or something. But yeah, this, so this first half. We'll do both halves today, but we're talking about before first paint or now I think they've Google's redone it and it's before first meaningful paint. Like if, does everyone know Lighthouse, their tools, analyze performance? Well, we could look at that a little bit, but they, they have a bunch of 
terminology they use for how everything loads. Because when it gets to the browser, that's where everything comes uh, together. But before first paint, one of the key things is, even though this is a front-end developer, we're React, we're front-end, we're the browser, so much happens before our code gets to the browser. So this first half, we don't look at any code itself at all. It's how it's, how is it getting there? How can it be affected? And, and then one other thing is, you can think of network speed to the device in context, right? In a context, I have some lists, but that's, you know, the DaVita case. Is it a doctor walking around? You, even if it's downtown Denver, you know, things can affect, and there was um, fiber to the building. Why are these doctors having these slow load speeds when we're two buildings over in downtown Denver and the developers are like, hey, this loads in two and a half seconds, which is kind of slow, but not that bad. But when the doctors are a few blocks away, in the why is it five to 10 or locking up for them? Why is it happening? And that's when we got to identify the context. And for most people's things, maybe it is the standard just consumer application like Lyft or Uber. It's just users on the end and maybe they're mobile or not, but that's an important thing to remember. But what, what can happen is when we have those really harsh speeds, you know, you can throttle your speeds to test. When you're, when you're in a good office with good, you can throttle your speeds and check. That's when all these performance things come out. If you have fiber and you're fibered it, you're cabled into your network, you can have the worst performance and you're not gonna know because the network can handle it. Um, so that's what the context will be. Um, and another key thing that I, it's, it's my personal go-to, maybe you all have experience with this too, but the number of network requests, I'm assuming maybe you know, but in case not every browser, assuming we're talking React, not hybrid apps or anything yet, but every browser, Chrome, Firefox, et cetera, has limited network requests. You know, you have a single page app, so you need to get your data, you know, from somewhere. And most browsers, it's usually six per domain, um, but that's one of the one of the first things I look at. And, and in this Davita case, you know, I looked up and to do a single page transition you know, in this doctor's app, <laughs> there were there were over fifty requests. So I was like, oh guys. And then in the architecture meeting, the the architecture guys on Zoom out of the state were like, well, we we switched to microservices last year. We're not changing this, so that's why we had to make fifty calls. In in our but then there was this huge fight, and then you know, like, oh, they're they're dissing us. I was like, hey, I'm not dissing you. Like, I see why you did microservices. Um, and our solution was do a proxy layer. We, we're not touching your microservices. We'll just do a known proxy layer. And because I'll go, but is, is this, does everyone know all this stuff or maybe you heard of it? But that, that's what this is going to. And, and I have some solutions. Um, so um, here I've taken, and I have links here. I could share these with everyone. This talk is on slides, yes, so it's open source. Um, but first meaningful paint is the time when the page's primary content appeared on the screen. This is going to be our primary metric for user perceived loading experience. This is like your initial, like loading, loading, loading your website for the first time as opposed to navigation once you're in. Has everyone heard of this term? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and and there, can, there may be other terms that kind of mean the same thing. <laughs> yeah, Lighthouse now uses, they keep changing it. And I think the main one they use now is largest contentful paint. Ah. <laughs> updated version of this. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a year out of date. Yeah, it just change, they change every couple of years, just for fun, I guess. But we get we get the point though. It's like before the user can do anything, whatever term, um, I need to update that. And here is that kind of synonymous with rendering, like. Well, so rendering, and again, or, or at least my terms, rendering would be the rendering is the action that React or Vue or whatever okay. is yeah, yeah, yeah. is rendering your HTML and your DOM. So, but this would be once that rendering is done. Okay, gotcha. And, and sometimes you can do partial loading as well. Another technique to handle, but yeah. So th this is like basically when the rendering's over of your first page load. Okay, I see. Right, does that make sense? As opposed to like rendering might be, in one of the performance things we'll get into is, or maybe I don't touch, but it's a good point is that sometimes I've found the culprit is very not well done Redux in React is one of the worst things for having renders happening when you don't want them. Say you've loaded the page, the user can see it. If you do your, um, you know, React, your init your component, sometimes it's going off all the time anyways. If you have very bad Redux, it's this okay. culprit. And, I've, and it just goes on 50 times after the page is there. So rendering is usually the culprit, but, but still rendering happens after the assets get to the browser. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, that's very helpful, thank you. Oh, sure. Well, we, and and I'm, I, I love the back and forth. I'm, I'm a bit better, like Socratic method here, not like dictating, because he knew he knew the bet. 
the updated term for the top one. <laughs> but I don't show these. You know, some of you may already know this, but you know, I'm, I try and reference things because a lot of times it's like, what are we talking about? So here's, you know, and I think I, up, I hope I updated this link. Well, here we have updated the 22nd. Um, these are just some common terminologies of, of metrics, and there's like somewhere in here. Yeah, here's all these different terms, which can affect you at different times. Here, here, oh, here we have first contemporal paint. I had first meaningful paint, but they have largest contemporal paint. So let's see the difference. First contemporal paint measures the time from when the page starts loading to when any part of the page's content is rendered on the screen, as opposed to largest contemporal paint measures the time from when the page starts loading to when the largest text block or element is rendered on the screen. So that's this would be like the first bit. So, so it is important when you're, but no matter which one you use, you got to have some pointer because there can be 80 factors. And what I'm, what the point I'm trying to make is just pick a factor and just make sure everyone's measuring the same things because you can very easily, you know, everyone wants to pull apart numbers as engineers. But if you're measuring even a slightly different thing, it, it doesn't mean that that metric isn't useful. But you got to compare, especially with this stuff, you got to compare your apples to your apples. Um, you know, and we have first input delay which by these guys is measures the time from when a user interacts with your site, click a link, tap a button, um, to the time when the browser is actually able to respond to that interaction. That's one thing we were having in that DaVita case. It was like, and the doctors say, hey, it, we can't get it half the time it locks up, and then it locks up and we can't push the button. And they have to close the tab. Um, yeah, this could be, like, if you're using, like, one of the server-rendered React frameworks, like Next or something, like, that would be the time between you see like the HTML and stuff is on screen, but the React event handlers have to hydrate before anything will happen when you click yeah. stuff. So like that, that tends to be what introduces that first input delay is if you have a crap load of code that's involved in that hydration process. Or if you have not, I, I haven't done much with server-side rendering. Most of my stuff's been, that's good to know. I throw the, from what hasn't ever, is a lot of people have you done a lot of server-side rendering or Apps or what's everyone's experience coming in? Well, I've only gone to school. So. It's still it's still important that there's you probably there's new terms that I don't know that they're doing in there. Yeah. Well, great. Well, you just but just example of just trying to establish some common terms. I don't use you know all these to the rest of the thing, but just saying pick some things. Um, you know what I I think this one was a good. What do I have down here? Yeah, time to first meaningful paint, the layout based approach. And here there's documents, at least, and, and maybe the context I'm more using this is, is in a large, like a large enterprise corporation, like Trade Desk, like DaVita, like where you have people all over the country. You know, if you're a small team of five or 10 and you're in the same building in the same time zone, you, know, you, can, you can walk over someone's computer and point it out. And these terms don't mean as much, but when you're trying to coordinate with server side teams in a different state or in a different time zone or a different country, that's or at least just saying here's here's the number we're talking about. Let's reduce this number at this point because there could be ten different points, and it's not just databases and it's not just a number of network requests. It can also be in the Davida case. It was well, sure, it's there's these million dollar um, dialysis machines, but their Wi-Fi router was one at the far end of the hall, and aside from the distance to the router was the electromagnetic interference from the machines. You know, and that, that's what all has, and this is, this is an extreme case, but I'm trying to give everyone context because there is a lot of work. I'd say half my work in the last six years returning to America has been in-house single page apps. That's DaVita, Dish Networks over there. Um, there was ReFiJet, was a refinancing company. All these were single page apps that were internal tools as well. So I, I don't know if anyone's had that, but a significant chunk of my work coming back has not been public facing websites, not the standard thing. And there's a lot of work out there. So all like within their own network. Yep. Well, it, well, and or at least within, within like the people using it are an employee as opposed to a customer. You know, the dish case where I was at. You know, the the application we were building there, which was React, which was one. Of, maybe I shouldn't say it, was one of the worst cases of badly written Redux, <laughs> with ten times more nodes that shouldn't be there, but um, was the internal tool that the salespeople use. So, so if you're a dish customer and you rang in. You're talking to someone that's like activating your subscriptions and managing your things. 
that software was just a super fancy reactor and it had a lot of very fancy things too we had we could break it out in different windows and one window could control the other window like that was a pretty cool thing but we had a lot of performance and that's where uh, but but you had that's where the network you could control you know half the agents were at home but somewhere in house um the, and the, that's in that case i'd say our performance issues were the redux it was a code issue as were at davida it wasn't that it was you know having elect, uh, electromagnetic magnetic machines bad wi-fi routers that were far away from the users um because the doctor is not going to be using 5g walking down the street in his case he's going to be in a wi-fi network for these machines that's the context um and, and so it, it maybe you like to I'm assuring everyone knows this, but I like to break it down, especially where I am specifically talking single page apps here. And at the, the bottom of the line, whether you React or Vue or Angular, they can all be done very well. They can all be done very poorly. But what they all have in common is they're all just static assets until they're executed in the browser. And at least I like to call the for single page apps, I like to call the browser the runtime as opposed to a server. You know, it's not the LLBDM, which is on an iPhone running your Swift, which is kind of Objective-C, or it's not Python on a server. You know, the, the runtime isn't the server somewhere. It's actually your browser on your computer. So that's that's where all the, and, but before, before your stuff even runs, it has to get sent there. And there's many ways to improve that performance. And it's still just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And maybe you have images, um, but, the, but the thing, it's not. It's not SAS, it's not SCSS, it's not Stylus. It's not TypeScript, it's not CoffeeScript, as sometimes as newer developers and even older ones that are specialists, like maybe you're a really good coder, but you're looking at your editor, you know, and, and the end user, they don't know if it's SAS or Stylus or TypeScript, um, but those things may help you code. That's your experience, but the end user, those, those things don't mean anything unless you use those tools well. Um, and let's see. So here's here's a, a short list of some things that in, in like taking I, I tried to make this that can account everything that can get in the way. You know, most user cases maybe, you know, your your standard consumer thing. There's just your servers connected to the internet over 5G or their Wi-Fi to their phone. But in other cases, um, you know, you need to you know it, what's the speed to the building. Like this is what I had to go through to figure out what the heck was happening for the Davida case. What's the speed to the building where the doctors are? Because they are in different buildings across the nation, but we're doing this here. But what's the speed of the building? Is it fiber optic? Maybe it's satellite. There were cases where, you know, um, picture of person with kidney failure on um, a reservation in New Mexico. They don't. Have, they have a well. They have satellite network, and, and and or maybe there's a small settlement and there's three machines. We had cases like that. So what was the speed to that doctor's building? Um, satellite, is it the phone network? Is, is there even a phone network? Um, is it cable? Are they cabled to like, a, they, this is a web, they could cable into a laptop and walk around the thing. Um, you know, what's the Wi-Fi router's max speed? You know, sure, maybe they haven't updated the router in a while. You know, routers do have limited connections as well. You know, I, I at least have a smart home. And the one thing I found, I had two, I had two smart switches. They were great. Then I added five more. Then I added a camera and it all started and like, what changed? Why did it stop working? Because my router couldn't handle the connections that my house went from 10 things to 50. So there's all these factors can affect your end user. And in that, that's probably a rare use case, but still, if you're building some of these internal tools, you just got to remember it. Um, the device's antenna strength, you know, a laptop has a stronger Wi-Fi antenna than your phone. A tablet has a slightly stronger one. There's many, there's this identifying your end users. Um, things um the just how far they are from the router or a thing if there's electromagnetic interference probably another very rare case but um one night they found out in the davida case they for whatever reason has shut down all the machines and suddenly the app was working better and we're like oh because that's just general machinery and things just just like having a metal cabinet between yourself and a wi-fi router those can affect your users and these are all weird cases but this is someday you may need this <laughs> or you can just tick the box and it's not an issue at all but, um, and, and also the processor on the device, you know, now I think in the last three years, most devices, even, even a cheap $50 Android you buy, it's a prepay, has a very good processor. That was not the case even four or five years ago. That can make a difference, um, fragmentation in the platforms. But, but five or six years ago, and even in New Zealand, I remember 
having cheaper phones because everything's twice as much overseas, you know, what people make per hour to what they buy is a lot less. So you had, we had to be super performant, make it, that, that's when you notice on these lesser devices. Um, one, one thing we could do is that I still do is buy cheap Androids to test on. Because then if it works on that, then it's faster. Like test the worst case scenario, not just your best case. And, and is, is everyone, before I get, is everyone familiar with like um, the inspector, right? You, you, even if you did code school, you open the Chrome inspector, right? You know how to do that? And does everyone know how to throttle the speed? So it, what about finding the protocol of the HTTP request? Does everyone know how to do that? Uh, maybe. Oh, I see some maybe. Well, I'll, I'll go because, well, yeah, what I can do is somewhere in here, I have a thing where, um, because it's not a default, like you open up your network tab, you'll see HTTP or you'll see the your domain URL, but it doesn't always by default have whether it's HTTP one, two or three. Um, and it, again, I think that's not a front end thing. Like we, as the, every browser, supports HTTP one, two, and three in WebSockets, but it has to be also be set up on your server. So as a front-end developer, the browser's doing it for you. That That's my terminal of the browser being the runtime, but if your server doesn't have an SSL certificate, then for sure, you, you can't have HTTP two or three without an SSL certificate. And it's, it's there. It's actually not hard to do. I've done it as well, but if we get the complaint and we need to identify the problem as front-end people. Seven is interesting. I never, that's not what I've thought about at all. Like electromagnetic interference. Yeah. And I'll admit that is a super rare case. I imagine it doesn't happen often, but still. Yeah. But the, in the, in our DaVita case where people's lives are on the line and, and we're looking at every aspect, like, why is it happening? And we do things and we fix the HTTP too. And, and at one point I was like, can I just walk? Can I, I just, I want to walk over and see what these people do. And then I was like, you know, we noticed that you, you would change on your location in the room, but you're right. These, these are edge cases, but someday but th that still but, some, something to keep in mind yeah and also the point that web technology can be used for so many things you know not it doesn't have to be a native ios app um, with the controlled release process etc you can you can have private secure web apps on your local networks and things yeah um, some, some tools that you look for to like quickly isolate whether it's a network speed issue to the device Sure. Um, we can, well, first is your network tools and, and obviously more measuring at different points. So look, think of a whole chain. There's your servers to an end user and break the chain down. You know, it's getting an end user. And, you know, so say in, in the Davida case, we had Wi Fi. And then you, you, you know, you plug in and measure your speed at the router, like plug in with an Ethernet cable to your router measure your speed there, then measure it on a device. Even if you do it at home, like I have my home laptops cabled in and I can see on standard Xfinity, I get 980 to on the cable, but on my phone right next to it, cause, cause my Wi-Fi router is 30 feet away. I dropped to 300 or 400 on my, on my iPhone. It's, it's you got, you got to measure every point yeah. and then measure at your, you know, so you have your router, but then maybe your, your cable into the, in, in a building like this, maybe your cables down there, maybe it's coming in. Maybe there's a I call a network guy, but measure it, <laughs> measure it every, but just, just plug it in and measure, you know, speed test, right? You know, everyone knows speed .org or the Google things. Um, but, but what we could do is you can draw a map of like all the different things, like try your end user, draw your server, um, you know, and then they're over Wi-Fi where they're cabled in and measure the different points. Um, but, but then also the, the biggest effector is the, the network request, the number of network requests is, is usually the biggest culprit in everyone's case. Um, not always, but in, in this, or what I'm trying to say is we, there's stuff we may or may not have control over. Um, you know, that's why we need to make our stuff as fast as we can. And also, even if we're in a controlled environment that has really good, like you can throttle your speeds. I can, I can even show everyone how to do that now. If, does, if you don't know how to throttle your speed. We all know our network tab, tab does, has everyone's, I don't know if some of you do, but here's how you can throttle your speed right on your, if you didn't know. I'd mess around with that. Yeah, there's so much in the inspector and the inspector changes as well. And you can set your own speeds, but that's a way that if you want to. You can also change your processor well, we can to, now. To, to emulate slightly worse 
Oh, is that no. see? There's a new one for me. Which is that under? Is it's that? In, it's in there too. It, it probably just uh, memory application. Maybe you know, it's going to be. It's in the same place as probably or it used to be. I pro may have changed it. Um, sure, but yeah, I believe there's it. there's a way to to kneecap your processor, which because it can be your processor in a lot of cases because it's the uh, JavaScript is a JIT. It's pr processed on your system. So if you have more archaic phone, like it could very well be your processor. That's that's just you're trying to use WASM and the phone wasn't built to do that. <laughs> or you have a lot of messy Redux or or any or messy any state management where there's heaps of extra nodes all referencing each other. Causing and in in extra renders, mm -hmm. you know, like um, you know, going this into whatever view Angular React, whatever your init component render render finish rendering, putting timers in there and counts. Does everyone know console dot count? You can do console dot log. You can also do console dot count. It's native JavaScript. Put it in like your init of whatever component type you're in. And watch it go. You'd be surprised. Even even a well done Angular React review, you're still getting. I found two or three initial renders, strangely, and then pull ones. I've had up to fifty or sixty, and that was. Mm. So that, that, that's the code level. Um, let's see. But um, you know what we established for us as developers is is the bare minimum when you're writing new stuff. You got to make sure less than two seconds. And this could vary by your case, but you got you got to have some common thing and be like, hey guys, when you're developing, sure there's performance people, there's this, there's testers, but we got to be responsible. We just can't type a bunch of JavaScript and pass it off to these other people. We need at least for our commits, in in, in our in our review was part of our review process was someone else doesn't just review your code, they have to pull your PR and you have to run it and compile it, <laughs> and make sure you can navigate to that thing. Per page, per page, individual pages was two seconds, anyways, which is still quite slow on a fast network. But we had to start somewhere. Yeah. Um, I do get into more here, and we may jump a bit, but here we go. So yeah, here I we already talked about this, but we like here's here's three con contrasting ones. Like a, a user con is a fiber optic to a building, enterprise network, and Wi Fi in the building. No electrical interference. It's still a reference to the V thing, like our downtown Denver offices, high speed and reliability in this context. B was any situation where the user device over Wi Fi with interference, the clinic with medical machines, and varying distance of device like to the Wi Fi router. You know, or maybe you're at a group cafe or something. And C was like satellite to a building, straight to a phone network, at speeds less than 25 megabits per second. I know that's unheard of in downtown Denver days, but still in different countries in New Zealand and rural areas, and, and especially remote places of America, that may be your speed. On your, even on your mobile app, maybe you, you have an app for traveling and someone needs to use it across the highway across Utah. You may have that one bar and you may still want it to be able to do something so you can have progressive degradation um, and highly unpredictable, or you can have like save states, like save offline, those those sorts of things. Um, right, and, and another thing we all understand, hopefully that, or if not, it's okay, but JavaScript as a language is asynchronous, it means you can spin off 10 to 20 things and it can all do them. And if, if, you, if you want it that way, you can have them not block each other. Um, but JavaScript in the browser, your network requests if they're HTTP one, which was more the norm a few years ago, they're not asynchronous. So the language is, but remember there's these network requests, which is user on six and say you have 50 in this Davida case, you know, it does six and then it has to wait for those six to finish or one or two of them to add on the others. So it cascades in your waterfall. Um, and that's one of the key things. And that was one architecture argument I got into, unfortunately, like this head guy that just did the microservice, he said, JavaScript is an asynchronous language. I was like, yeah, but this is, but it runs in the browser and look at this, look at these, you can see the steps. Has anyone seen that on a bad site? You see the steps are only around six or eight. And that was, it was, it took a lot of politics to get them to realize that um, in the end, yeah. So 
you, you can see a lot of this is related. I, I hope to not be circling back too much. Um, so in that case, the proxy is reducing the amount of requests the browser is making, but then once it goes into the system, all the requests are still the same. Correct. So so the way we solved that of, of many, but the biggest chunk was we said, hey, you guys just finish these microservices. We don't want you to redo them. We don't want a monolith. But what we did was we built a node proxy layer. So we, uh, you know, on, we basically broke it down to every page navigation, which our goal was to just get it down to six or less requests. Um, in, so we, the, the app, the web app would make a, a request over the network to our proxy. It would make one request or, or six, but it wasn't 50 from the single page web app to the proxy. And then even if it did need those 50 other microservices called the Node.js proxy layer, it would send up those 50 concatenate it because Node.js server side doesn't have the network request limits. It's the browser. It's still all JavaScript, but that's what we could do with the proxy layer is send, you know, you can send one or six requests and it can spit off and combine all these different microservices because it's a server side JavaScript, combine it, and also cut out all the- You have a much lower latency link back to the microservices. Yes. And if, if you're on the same premises. <laughs> yeah. But even if even if not, like still should be probably fiber between data centers, right? Yeah. And, and we can get, and we also, we were getting the, micro, the microservices were general. And that's, I think that's a good architecture. Microservices are for a company that maybe data was being used for insurance people and these doctors. So 80% of what was being said, we didn't need it either for this particular, that was why our, we were like, hey guys, don't, you don't do anything. We'll just build our own, but let us build our own proxy layer and give us the AWS EC2. <laughs> people, people call that pattern back, back end for front end, the FF. Yes. And it can be useful as well, like to just to like clean stuff up as well. You know, like make the API, like the shape of a response just better to work with on the front end. So and, and cut out the crap we don't need. Right, all the crap you don't need, yeah. And, and still have it that they can take the microservices up and down, there. or maybe there are different databases. I mean, like in the DB, I never installed it. Some places I'll see the database or somewhat, sometimes I don't even see it. It's just you know, a whole 30, team of 30 other people doing it. Um, yeah, so you can look at the quantity, the size of the request, and the type. Uh, where, hang on, did I miss one? And then I, I love this diagram. It's it's slightly outdated. I, I when I was redoing this yesterday, I couldn't find a better one. But this is where we have our different types, and it, it is because web sockets can be an option depending. But one of the key things is you know you have your HTML HTTP request, and here it's HTTP one and two. But notice web sockets kind of go around it. The last time I checked, and this is always browsers are changing every week and updating. Web sockets don't, they have, they do have limits. I Last I heard was around 40. It's a harder number to chase. So maybe you're doing some sort of like a uh, chat application like that. In my case, that use for that was dish networks there. Maybe an agent's like helping chat customers. Maybe you do need that, but this, this is how this all fits together. And when we get into like um, sockets, may, maybe you all know, this is like hardcore networking, hardware layer UDP. If anyone else knows, feel free to jump in, but this is the stuff we're worried about because this is all under the hood. And newer in the last few years, there's WebRTC. This is doing video and things over it. So it also doesn't have the same limits, but it's it's not as much applied to a single page app, but we did, Davida, the other thing I was helping on was this video chat app and we were using WebRTC over it. So that's what I'm trying to just make sure you're choosing the right connection type for what you need to do, which in single page is usually always HTTP. And if it's twos, the standard now, um, but three is a newer of official standard for it came out in 2022, I think. Um, and I, I do have some numbers on the usage, but surprisingly, even when I looked up yesterday, only, yeah, I looked these up yesterday 20% of internet traffic was, 26% was HTTP3. HTTP2 is 45%. And so 50% of the rest of the internet's traffic is still HTTP1. And it, it's really not a hard thing to do. Even in Node, like all you need is an SSL certificate and you can spin up, you can make your express server or your home thing on your home. You can make it HTTP2. Um, but uh, that's, that's some interesting to, to statistics. And what do I have in here? 
Can I can I give my voice break? Does anyone want to see a video for three minutes? I sometimes I do voice breaks and talks. For me. <laughs> Will this come through? Will the video come through? It should. Yes. Let's find out. Should I have yeah. yeah. And then no, we can hear it. No. Okay. Skip it. We'll read their lips. Uh, it's mostly voiceover. Where is the echo? Watch my videos on YouTube today so far. Audio is off. Right. Um, so now, who 
Hang on. I was going to show how to. Um... Got about 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes. Oh, we got to fly now. Well, here's how you get. <laughs> Maybe I should. Can everyone see here? I've opened up my network tab. And see, the, the you right click on the top of the tab, and this is how you show your protocol. By default, as far as I know, protocol that would show you whether your network, your H2, H1 is, um, wait, why? Wait, there we can see a difference. Some are files. Files is like cache locally things. Um, this is Google, so it looks like they have HTTP3, but a lot of the time you'll see HTT, this H3 will be H1 or 2. Um, so that's how you could look up. And again, the browsers, all the, all the main ones already support it, but you have to tell your server guys because they may not, a lot of them made it on C Sharp for just 10 years and not doing anything else. Um, okay, so we'll just go faster. Um, Solutions to do these is make your app time load when you're developing as part of your PR check, less than two seconds, or some other number. Test actually in your contest. Like, make sure you or someone if is using it, using your app on a, if it's especially if it's on a phone, on a 5G network, on a 3G, whatever, or if you're traveling, use it in the car while you're driving. Like the whole that what the guy said about HTTP3 switching networks is if that's your travel app. If it's a parking app, you're not moving. Maybe it doesn't matter. Um, HTTP two or three static, you know, you, you know, with single page apps, everyone know you can dump it in an S three bucket, and make it a server. You don't need Nginx, you don't need any of that stuff anymore. You can just put it in Amazon S three bucket and have it go across CDNs and everything, or whatever Azure option or the other one. Um, you can use Gzip as well. It's that's another usually super easy to thing, whether it's C sharp or Node. You know, these these are your server side. That's I, I found surprised so many times. So guys like, well, it doesn't matter. I'm like, well, yeah, it kind of does. You know, enable gzip on all your on all your files. That's that's another thing you might have to. You can check this in your network tab, but you may have to right click to show the compression type. And so that's another thing there. You can also, if it is a really bad case and maybe you can't, you can use domain sharding. If you remember the in the browser, these network limits are six per domain. So the browser itself could actually be thirty, but you you can. Yeah, and maybe for whatever reason you have no control over whatever this other side of the company built, you can use domain sharding and you could spin off 12 at the same time as long as each batch is to a different, you know, dot com or something. So that's, it's not the best option, but it's the thing that can be done. I, I'm sure everyone here knows about lazy loading modules, right? You're, you're, that, that's your React components, your page navigations, um, you know, optimize your log. You know, you'd be surprised. Has anyone had to do like an Okta integration? Or fusion off, like you know how many redirects and things happen when you log in with Okta? Like sometimes it's 10 to 20 of like it's like cutting those down. You know, that only happens once. That's your initial login, but those are things you just gotta break down, just make it smaller each piece. Um another thing, I'll skip it, but everyone knows TypeScript. You know, you write TypeScript in your editor, but TypeScript does not run in the browser. And even if you use your inspector in a TypeScript app and you see TypeScript in your editor you're viewing your source map to your TypeScript and usually TypeScript actually expands the number of lines of code you write because types don't exist in JavaScript or they're just the basic type of, which only has seven things. So every time you write a type, it may be one line of like a num an enum, but that's expanding the 30 lines. And, but you know, maybe it doesn't, that's where you trade off. You realize if you're using a lot of that, it can expand. Um, and another newer option these days is if you're to, cut down on at least initial load times is you can do hybrid apps like capacitor, React Native, or those things, because then the people have, have the native app there and it's easier to get to. They, they get around your initial load time. So those are some solutions. Um, <clears throat> more um, resource preloading is a whole nother issue. You can look this stuff up, but that's the way you can do it, especially with CSS. You can do caching, another thing as developers, you can do those. I know inline styles in React are all the rage these days, but those don't work until your JavaScript gets to the browser and processes that. And it's not, and all the browsers and even the devices, they have it, the, the CSS goes on a different thread entirely. So if you can write normal, even just SAS and pre-process it, 
you'll get a huge performance in that CSS. Your CSS usually, in most cases, changes a lot less than your JavaScript. And you, that's another way to just perform the code side that we as developers can use. Write CSS, um, you know, even, um, do I have it in here? But it's, it's the next one, but I have a few slides on that, but that's, you know, using, does, does everyone write semantic HTML? Does everyone know what that means? Because it's, I think it's a lot, I see a lot of React and everything's a div, 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 div. Does anyone know what semantic, what I mean by semantic HTML? If not, it's okay, like I'll explain it. But you know, we have HTML tags like paragraphs, headings, but there's also ordered lists, own order lists, and there's a sides and there's nav tags now. And then you, you can write that in your CSS. What, what I found is I've worked with a lot of good developers that have three or five years experience and they're just like, oh, we love inline styles because we just write JavaScript. But then you look at it, it's just div, 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 div everywhere. And it's all this extra code and processing. Well, and it's specifically CSS in JS, right? Like, yes, not, not. You can do inline styles that still uses kind of like vanilla CSS, but yeah, yeah, CSS you, in JS. Is yeah, kind of when, when you're writing the CSS inside your React component, because yeah. it's still the CSS language, but as opposed to using like a class, like you write a CSS file and you, you're, you say all heading ones are this font and you it, it finds it by the H1 tag as opposed to writing it in your like root um, component. Or, or you can use a mixture, you can dump a lot. Like maybe sometimes there's a specific need for some animation or some click, do that in your component, but that doesn't have to be the norm everywhere. There's the, you know, there's the right time for every kind of tool. Um, you know, and if you write semantic, you'll find you may need less components even. Um, you know, and less, 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 but it, that's all specific. So that's the performance benefit for semantic HTML is you'll just likely end up with less nodes. It's not like the browser is going to load the right. specific text. Like, have you looked at a React app with a lot of inline styles? Like in the inspector, it looked less, sorry. And if you looked at the HTML, the con, it's, it's like, what is this stuff? Because you realize too, I mean, a lot of times it doesn't matter, but semantic HTML, your business desires are search engine optimization, like div, 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 div doesn't help Google. But, and and you, there may be cases it doesn't matter, but for search engines and screen readers accessibility, you know, if you're building a government site that needs to be handicap accessible, try and use a screen reader. And if it's div, div class, NJXP14 thing, div class, NJX, or heading one, heading two, paragraph, nav tag, because the, the screen readers will read those up. And that's also how, I haven't done heavy SEO in a few years, but that's basically screen readers and SEO, like is the same thing as web accessibility at the root of that is your semantic HTML because those for ages, screen readers didn't even use JavaScript the same with searching is that's why you have that static HTML. I guess like 20% of the web has some type of a disability. Yeah. And, and web accessibility is a whole other thing. I did, I did a, it was called accessibility U in Texas like 10 years ago, um, but it was a conference and it made me, they're like, you this whole time you're using a screen reader, <laughs> write your code, don't look at it, read it in the screen reader, then style it afterwards. But it's, it's any, sometimes you, some business cases, you may not need it, but just start, these are all the different little things you can do. And I personally love semantic HTML. I see divs and I'm just like, oh guys, come on. But, it, but those semantic HTML helps you also write natural CSS as opposed to inline styles. Like you write your React component or, or it, it can be an Angular thing too. You don't need to use those classes and tags because it's just on that thing right there as we're writing your semantic HTML. Um, yeah, right. and there's a performance benefit with that. Then. Yes, L less code. You use, like, you'll tend to use less elements and like it's hard to create lots of unnecessary elements if you're trying to be semantic, right? And that can have an impact. Yeah, and you've got like CSS that's just targeting a head element or something like that versus six classes. And, and that's where you, instead of, instead of a React component being your reusable thing, an H1, an H1 HTML tag is your reusable thing, or the button tag is reusable. And you may, maybe you put a class, like a CSS normal class is the same thing on there. Do I have a few more minutes or are we all, are we either two? Okay, well, Blaze, I have, everyone's very knowledgeable, which is cool. You know, I, we, we never know um, who's coming. I've talked about this, but here's, here's the theory is HTML is your content. CSS is how it looks, maybe with limited behavior, you know, animations and hovers, but JS is your behavior. And right now the trend is JavaScript, everything, everywhere, but you can use it too much. Um, and there's many shades of gray, but that's, 
this is the way it's forgetting react and angular you can have the same issues in react angular view whatever but at the end it's all html css and javascript and that's what runs in your browser which is very easy to forget <laughs> these days you have preprocessors which help you we love them as developers but the end user doesn't care you guys we've talked about this um Cache, you have messy DOMs, needs to execute. What do I have? You can, does anyone know pseudo classes? Look them up. You know, look, if you're writing a raw, which you may have, ah, cool. Um, forget that. Um, bundlers, this this is actually probably less bytes, the coolest thing now. Is everything using byte instead of webpack on other hood these days, I think? But that's your, how you, concatenate, minify all those different things to, to help get your your assets to the browser. I, I have a, these are, were just some demos that take some TypeScript and then show you how much it explodes actually in code lines. Let's, I think, does this one work? Not that one. You can see here, if you never look at, so here we have 107 lines of TypeScript on the left but look at how much more is over on this other side. Um, you know, all this catchy, there's all these, these case, like this, this switch case, this, this is the kind of crap, throw your type error. This is the kind of stuff that TypeScript makes that use a developer may never actually see or view. Because even if you inspect this and it's shipped with a, with a, um, a map, a JS map, you're still going to see your TypeScript when you're inspecting the browser, you're not seeing the size and the extra lines. Um, but you're not saying it, but just, you know, weigh it up. Um, let's see. Just a note, five years ago is a big thing. Everything that TypeScript caught your errors in the browser. It doesn't, TypeScript only type checks at your compile time. So no matter how much you type, and it may error when you're building it, it doesn't error in runtime in the browser. <laughs> that was but does everyone know that maybe? Or, but still, it does help. If you use Nest.js as a server and using an ORM, and you can use your types across your front end and your server and your MongoDB. It is, it is great. There's, that's where we have those benefits, but just, just throwing types everywhere isn't a solution. Um, TypeScript is a DX tool. It's meant for developers. It's not meant for your users. Yeah, I think, um, well, I think that's probably a good time, isn't it? Yep. How about that? And this, cool. this other bit was all after first paint. Because we were all, I like the back and forth instead of just. Really good, thank you. Thanks, sorry. Was it boring? Did everyone know all that? Did someone at least learn something new? Definitely, yeah. 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 I learned five new terms that I didn't know around. Really. That's also my point is that you, because these things in the real life application, it sounds like you've been to this, you're just out of code school. These are the things that you're going to, you can't, like, especially the HTTP thing in the service, you have to convince someone else, right? Especially if you're in the standard. A lot of us can do server side, but often just to divide effort. There's a front end JavaScript. Maybe there's a back end node. You're not doing it. You got to convince them because we get the complaints. <laughs> and how and how to solve it? Open your inspector real quick. I'll show you the CPU profile. You found it. Yeah. So go to performance, <laughs> and then click on the gear on the right. And there you can do throttling. All right. Uh, so you can you can do four uh, four time and six time reduction in. So it's, you have a quad core processor, you basically, and why would you want to do that? To simulate, to simulate lesser performance. Like, okay. How I would use that, like remember I was saying part of our, part of your review process could be, sure there's gonna is say, okay, someone does a PR, don't just, don't just look at their thing and comment and nitpick because they have semicolon somewhere, download their PR, start it, run it, and then you're, you, know, you don't have to walk to a 3G network that's hundred miles away to drop your drop your network speed to 3G and then also drop your processor speed and you can be like well hey it has to be less than four seconds load time or, or like on a page transition you can make up your own gotcha that makes some sense it's how you can catch it earlier you can also simulate this by just running a 4K YouTube video another <laughs> tap <laughs> oh, take up all your processor yeah just let your let your processor do G, uh, GPU decoding uh, especially on on Years that don't have that it can use, and nice. you can watch your system just tank on process and stuff. Sweet. I didn't know we could throw the process. Yeah, I learned something. Yeah. And the thing is, it's always changing. These tools change every three months, every four months. 
the term machines, but maybe what the takeaway is break things down from your from your servers to your end user, break them down and measure all the things, but look at the, the number of network requests and the type is usually always sadly the server side people don't care. They're like, they're using the same C-sharp library because C-sharp changes every 10 years. Because yep. their JavaScript changes every week, we're always on top of changes. But the browsers evolve too, that's. That's cool. All right. All right, I'm gonna stop recording. So thank you, YouTube, for hanging out with us.